we're going to hear about peculiar pediatric pavlodema from our own uh, Rachel Patel. Uh, she's currently winding up her stint uh, uh, as a resident on the pediatric ophthalmology service. Uh, we've loved having her on the service. We'll be sorry to see her go, but it's what happens. And uh, glad to get her up here to speak in Grand Rounds before she leaves us. All right. So I just wanted to talk about a few cases that we've seen uh, recently over the past few months. Um, when uh, I was asked to do this talk, I was looking in like the list of interesting cases that I have, and there was a whole series of kids with papilledema, and I said, well, this is fascinating. I don't see this that often, but apparently you all, each resident collects things on call, right? Like we, I apparently collect pediatric papilledema patients. So I'm gonna talk about three different cases, and I'm gonna go over them fairly quickly. We don't have a ton of time, but then at the end, I'll have a little bit more of a discussion about um, some things to take away from what I got out of uh, seeing these kids. Um, the first one is an infant uh, with sudden onset esotropia. Um, and so it's a nine month old girl. She's super cute. Unfortunately, I have no pictures of her. Um, one week ago, she had some fever and vomiting. It went away. But then four days ago, she had uh, her left eye turn in. And this was originally intermittent. And then for the last three days, it's been constant. Uh, she had a head ultrasound because she still had somewhat open fontanelles. And the pediatrician found that it wasn't a great view, but everything looked totally normal. Um, and she was otherwise doing fine in terms of her visual and medical development. So on examination, she could fix and fall with both eyes, but she did have an abduction deficit in the left eye. Um, she had about 60 prison diopters of ET by Kremsky and a very mild hyperopic cycloplegic refraction. And on dilated examination, her, exa her uh, nerves looked like this. These are not actually her nerves, um, but uh, they were very similar in that they, she had bilateral disc edema. So, to answer Griffin's question, to image or not to image, I think we're stuck imaging with the papilledema. So she got admitted, she had an MRI. Um, so you can actually see the esotropia on the MRI, but other than that, her MRI was fairly unrevealing. She also had a lumbar puncture. Her opening pressure was off the charts of what a pediatric um, little scale for opening pressure would be, it was over 38, but she didn't have very much else on her LP, white blood cell count of only one, protein was fine, there was no infectious uh, etiology that was discovered there. So at this point, um, fairly, uh, not, not a whole lot of contributing uh, information here, but um, just some thoughts about what a differential for this kiddo could be. Any thoughts? Okay, so the ones that I had, um, <laughs> IIH. It might help if you ask people, people specifically. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll get people on questions on cases two and three. Sounds good. Um, there are cases of IIH have been documented in kids like one years old, so that's a possibility. Meningitis, her profile didn't look exactly like that from her CSF. Um, leukemia, of course, you know, we want to be worried about uh, leukemia in kids who are especially that age. Uh, some other ones that are less likely that I'll get to later on, but. In conclusion, we kind of came to the thought that this is presumed like post-viral meningitis. She was fever and vomiting a couple of weeks ago. It did get better. She then had the intern in the eye. Um, so she was then, um, she did have a more of an extensive workup when she was admitted by neurology. And then she was discharged on a diamox taper over the next few weeks. She was patching the right eye just to make sure that um, her left eye was still being used even though it was uh, permanently interned for that time. And then one week later, her estropy had completely resolved. Her optic nerve edema had almost entirely resolved. Um, and she was doing great. One quick interesting thing about infants with uh, elevated intracranial pressure is their head circumference. I don't really think about this because most of the people I see with elevated ICP have fused fontanelles, but she had um, had a six month well child check a few months ago and had been in the 60th percentile of her head circumference. And then right before admission, she was up at the 95th percentile. So there are other signs that, that we can measure in these kids. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to some th to thoughts about her case uh, later on, but I'm just gonna jump ahead to the next one. And admittedly, I did not actually see this kid. So thanks to Tina Mamelis for helping me out with this one. So this is a kid with an ectopic pituitary. He's a 12-year-old boy. He came in for uh, evaluation for blurry vision for the last two or three months. He has a history of obesity and this known ectopic pituitary gland um, that resulted in growth hormone deficiency and hypothyroidism. And he had been off growth hormone for the past nine years and was just restarted on it two months ago. So he is on that growth hormone and then an astrozole. And he says, I have no pulse tinnitus. I just have some occasional transient visual obscurations in my left eye and that's it. 
So his vision was actually excellent in both eyes. He had no APD, full color vision. He was orthotropic with full motility. Blood pressure was normal. And then on RNFL, he has grossly swollen nerves. Um, segmentation is pretty bad on that RNFL there too. So thoughts about him. Okay, differential. There are lots. What do people think? Very true, could be. It's a 12-year-old obese kid. Oh, yeah. Okay, what else? Of course, exactly. Um, he's obviously got pituitary stuff. What if he has adrenal problems as well? That can also cause elevated ICP. Brain tumor is on there as well. And uh, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, of course. So he had imaging. Um, his MRI was just done recently. And he, of course, has an empty cella because he's always had an empty cella. Um, but he also had uh, a read which showed there's a little bit of narrowing of the transverse venous sinuses, but um, there's nothing, there's no, like normal flow voids. There's no uh, occlusion in any of his vessels. Um, so he was diagnosed with growth hormone related intracranial hypertension. And this is kind of an interesting entity because it's often. Uh, in kids within the first couple of months of them uh, initiating treatment with growth hormone. And this kid had been off of it for a long time. This was, he was just restarting it. Um, in one series of 22 <coughs> kids who had uh, growth hormone related intracranial hypertension, when they all had their first eye exam, they all had papilledema. So it was, you know, correlated. Um, they, their ICP often resulted in papilledema. Um, and then interestingly, when they stop the growth hormone, their papilledema and their symptoms go away pretty quickly. And so in his case, just a few days after um, C-sync therapy, he's already started having some subjective improvement, improvement and then he's going to be seen later this week, and we'll see how his, his vision is going from there. Okay, last case, this guy. Um, so it's an 18-year-old. He has a history of Bell's palsy, two concussions. Um, he was weightlifting, and then shortly after that, he developed right-sided weakness, tingling, and aphasia for 30 minutes. His parents flipped out, brought him to the ED. He had another episode of headache and aphasia in the ED, and so he got TPA. He had a normal CT, MRI, TTE with bubble study, and he was discharged on amitriptyline and sumatriptyline. and this was outside of uh, the university. Um, the next week he had intermittent headaches, he kept having this tingling, he was constantly vomiting, um, and then he developed blurry vision, and so another ophthalmologist diagnosed him with bilateral disc edema. So he got an LP, opening pressure was 29. Interestingly, he had a white count of 122, his protein was also high at 99, glucose was fine, um, he was started on acetazolamide and topiramate, and then he was referred to neuro-ophthalmology. So when we saw him, he had 20-30 vision in his right eye, 20-60 in the left, no APD. Um, he's had some estropia that was more prominent in right gaze, but also in left. And his nerves actually did look like this. Pretty dramatic. Um, and then, let's see. Catherine, do you want to read this Mac OCT for me? Sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So you, dramatically, yes, you can see the swelling of the nerve over there. And then there's a little bit of uh, like intraretinal fluid there and then some subretinal fluid as well. Um, and so he was seen by uh, a retina specialist who said, you know, this is, although there is subretinal fluid, this is most likely spillover from the nerve, probably not something that's actually coming from the macula itself. He had enlarged blind spots on his uh, visual field, and he had an extensive million dollar workup. The abnormal parts were an ANA and RPR and a Lyme antibody screen. The second two were thought to be biologically false positives. He had a um, repeat opening pressure of 33. His whites were again elevated. His protein was again elevated. He had a CTA head and neck, which was normal, and an MRI, which showed uh, like maybe some subtle enhancement of meninges and some fluid in the optic nerve sheets, but otherwise was fairly unremarkable as well. So his is a little bit more uh, complicated, but differential for him, I'm not gonna ask anyone to do this at this point, but viral meningitis, he's of course got the, the uh, white count, but all of his um, infectious workup for, from his CSF was normal. Handle, uh, neurosyphilis of course, Lyme norborreliosis. Someone threw out the idea of VKH at one point, but this doesn't look like VKH. So the diagnosis that we came to was this headache with neurologic deficits in CSF lymphocytosis or handle. 
Um, and for a full discussion, I think I'll, I'll refer you guys to uh, Tara Hahn's um, Grand Rounds presentation from last year, which was most excellent and goes into this in more depth. But just to uh, tell you a little bit more about it, it's a syndrome of episodic headaches, uh, transient neurologic deficits um, that tend to come um, in the temporally related to the headaches, which tend to come in clusters. And then a CSF with an elevated white blood cell count, but there's no nothing on MRI or any other diagnosis that would explain this. And so um, it is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion here. There can be some leptomeningeal enhancement, but that's about all that you can have. It's typically in young to middle-aged adults, so this guy does fall in that age. 15% of them do happen in kids, though. They often have an op uh, elevated opening pressure, and they can, but don't always, have papilledema. And they spontaneously resolve with supportive therapy over the next few months. So in his case, uh, he was um, given Diamox. He was eventually tapered off of it. His vision improved. He ended up being 20-20. He did have residual distortion, of course, which is most likely from this outer retinal irregularity from the leftover edema. Um, so just some closing thoughts about uh, disc edema in kids, in particular papilledema in kids. Um, the differential for this, although I've been bugging guys about it all, day is pretty broad. So there's, of course, primary, like IIH, um, idiopathic, and then there's all these secondary causes for it. And there are some that are more common in kids. So of course, I didn't show you a case of this, but like hydrocephalus or cerebral venous thrombosis, Chiari malformations, as we've kind of seen as well, um, tumors, leukemia, and then a whole bunch of meds, including growth hormone. Um, not to freak anyone out, but at one tertiary referral center of the kids who came in with papilledema from a secondary cause, over a third of them did have a brain tumor. So it is there that we do image these kids for a reason. So does papilledema correlate with actual intracranial hypertension? And so there's, I, this was actually interesting. There was an intracranial hypertension registry in the Pacific Northwest, and they enrolled 203 pediatric patients. Um, and they found that papilledema was present in 89% of those who had uh, IIH and about 78% of those who had secondary intracranial hypertension. So there is a strong correlation with it. Um, and then normal opening pressure in kids. So uh, when the first kid was uh, sent um, into the hospital, neurology called me and said, I don't even know what we're looking for for an opening pressure for her. Like in a, in a, in a nine month old, what do we do? And so there are studies that suggest that for kids less than eight, a normal opening pressure should be less than 18. Whereas they're, if they're older than eight, it's closer to adult values. But um, actually, recently, there was a, a, an article that was a prospective anesthesia study about determining a reference range. And they said 90th percentile um, for routine LPs sh and below should be considered normal. And they found that for kids who are sedated or obese, less than 28 centimeters of water was considered uh, normal. And if they're not sedated and not obese, that it would be a little bit less than that. OK, so finally, last closing thoughts, pearls. Um, MRI with, with and without contrast, of course, super helpful. Um, in kids maybe like who have bilateral dyskinemia, you want to make sure it's not also bilateral optic neuritis, and uh, with and without contrast could evaluate for that. Um, venous imaging is also super important because there, um, of course, is the possibility for occult venous sinus thrombosis, even in kids who don't necessarily have um, symptoms that are making you think that that's number one on the differential. You don't want to be missing that. Don't forget to check blood pressure. That can also cause disc edema, of course, even in kids. And kids also take medications, so make sure growth hormone, retinoic acid, tetracyclines, all on that list of things that you should be reviewing. All right. Um, thanks to these people who helped me see these patients. And I'll take any questions.